Okay, I have a, a double-barreled speaker. Um, good morning, everybody. So uh, I'm going to talk about software patents. What's the problem? It's a, a, a question with a pun. What's the problem? I'm a patent attorney. Of course, we can patent anything. But at the same time, what is the problem? Uh, why do we have software patents? And why are they causing all kinds of problems? Um, I'm going to be speaking for about an hour, but it would be interesting if you participate in the presentation. So feel free to, to interrupt, ask questions, uh, make counterclaims, so we can have a lively debate about the subject. Because it tends to be a very dry subject matter, but I, I will try to liven it up. Um, so to begin with patents, patents are a legal mechanism that we have for over a century, uh, a century and one year actually in Holland. Uh, you can see patents all over the place, although they tend not to be very uh, conspicuous. For example, uh, this is a professional habit. I look at, at these kinds of uh, plates. I don't know if you ever noticed them, but they have this little writing at the bottom where it says net octr uh, 53548, which is a Dutch patent, which is a uh, patent on the, on the lid. And the patent covers a mechanism whereby you can make a lid that will fit at the top, but it cannot fall down the well. So the construction is, is designed in such a way that you cannot lose the lid, which is very clever. Patent is a is a form of intellectual property, which is a term that I hate, uh, and lots of people hate it, but that's what they call it in, uh, in law school, so the term tends to stick. Problem with the term is it suggests that it's property. So it's something that you own, like your house, like your business, uh, but the term ownership really does not apply to intangible things. It doesn't apply to data, it doesn't apply to uh, things from the intellect, things that you think of, but, well, lawyers like the term, and when you talk about property, people think, oh, hey, I know property, therefore I understand intellectual property, so uh, uh, I know this. But that's no good. I'm going to use the term anyway. The term intellectual property covers a wide variety of topics, ranging from copyrights, so the things that you write, things that you produce, to patents, to databases, to trade secret, to semiconductors, trademarks, and designs. Copyright you're probably most familiar with. It is the basis of open source, but many other uh, systems as well. Copyright protects any and all creative expressions. So if you write a book, if you write a text, if you make a picture, if you make a movie, you write software, or even if you make a statute, it is covered by copyright. Great thing about copyright, it's very easy to obtain. You get it automatically as soon as you create the work. It lasts for a very long time. Uh, uh, Windows 7 is a copyrighted uh, piece of software, which is not open source. And yeah, you put... All right. So the color black is not copyrighted. Okay. Um, copyright is automatic, and it lasts for a very long time, at least 70 years after the date you die. So you will have copyright for a very long time and your grandchildren can still profit from the copyright on all the works that you created. You can license your work under a copyright and this is the basis for open source where they say, well, you can use my copyrighted piece of software provided you adhere to the GPL, the BSD, Mozilla license or any of the other open source licenses. And if you don't adhere to those licenses, you violate my copyright, I get to sue you, I get to recover damages, I can get an injunction against you and so on and so forth. Copyright, however, is a little limited. Copyright only protects against copying. So people take your code and they copy it. Maybe they modify it, maybe they do not modify it, but that is when uh, uh, you infringe your copyright. If you make the same work independently, it is not a violation of copyright. So people can look at what you are doing. They can even reverse engineer the software that you created, see how you did it internally, and then delete everything they saw and then write some piece of software themselves. Copyright does not cover that. Patents do cover that, so that is the main difference between copyright and patents. Yes, please. Yeah. So uh, the song "Happy Birthday" to the surprise of many people is still copyrighted because the author of that song has not died for over 70 years now. So it's, uh, it's under copyright and you cannot legally sing it, perform it, etc. in public. Uh, in a private birthday setting you can do it, but in public you cannot do it without having to pay some kind of royalties. If you now say, well, you know, happy birthday as such, I would like to make a birthday song, that is fine, that is your own work. What you cannot do is make a copy or a modified copy of that 
particular song. You cannot take that lyrics and say, okay, let me replace uh, uh, happy birthday with great birthday and change three notes, because then you are taking their work, modifying it, and making a modified version of their work. But you could say, well, let's make a song about somebody uh, that we wish a great birthday, and then you write your own song. That is fine. Theoretically, if you took somebody who lived in a cave for over 30 years, and you told them, hey, can you make a song about birthdays? And he would come out with the song Happy Birthday, he would not be infringing copyright. Because he lived in that cave, he could not have copied the work. He had no access to the work. Therefore, it is not a violation of copyright. It just happens to be coincidentally the same. If you have that kind of coincidence, the court will, however, say, okay, you prove that the guy lived in the cave. You will have to prove that you did not copy it because it is so very similar. And this actually is, is a thing that you can use in the context of open source. If somebody has a product or a piece of software out there that looks very similar to a piece of open source, you can say, okay, now you have to prove that you wrote that code yourself because it's so similar to that open source code out there and because of the internet, you had access to the code. So you now have to prove that you did not copy the open source code that you violated. And on the other hand, if some proprietary software vendor comes along and said, hey, open source guys, you copied my software, he will have to prove that you did copy the source code because it's proprietary, how could you get his source code? And without copying source code, there can be no infringement. So that's, that's actually one way of uh, uh, deflecting a copyright infringement claim. Um, next to copyright, as such, we also in Europe have something called database rights. Copyright protects creative things, but uh, if you have a non-creative thing, like a list of uh, postal codes or uh, a, a library with particular factual items or the result of a sporting event like who won the horse racing or indeed uh, how does the road from Eindhoven to Amsterdam actually run and which GPS coordinate do we come along that kind of thing is not protected by copyright they are facts in Europe it was felt that we needed some protection for facts because there's people that invest money in collecting facts and putting facts together and they want to use those facts in in commercial products so we introduced the database rights if you make a substantial investment in a database, in collecting facts, putting them together, putting good quality uh, on the facts, you have a right of ownership to that fact. You have intellectual property right on those facts. Nobody may use your database to make a derivative database. Nobody may copy your map. Nobody may copy your postal codes or whatever, because that would violate your database right. Uh, this applies only in Europe. In the US they feel this is stupid. You shouldn't protect facts and everybody should have the right to copy facts. You should only not have the right to copy a creative expression of facts, is what they say in the US. So you can take the US zip code system and you can make a database of zip codes, postal codes in the US, but you can however not take the Dutch postal codes because they are the private property of the Dutch postal system. You will have to make your own system of zip codes if you want to deliver postal mail in the Netherlands. Are they, are they registered? What do you mean? Uh, like patents are registered in some way? The database ah, it's a good, that's a good point. No. Uh, database rights are not registered, copy, uh, applied or whatever. Just like copyright, you get it automatically when you create the database. So if you come across a list of something, you will have to guess if somebody made a substantial investment, which is what the law says, and then you may not copy it. Of course, you can ask the guy, hey, did you make a substantial investment? Because I would like to copy your database, but you can already suspect the answer. Yes, please. So if I go to all the uh, cities in the Netherlands and ask them for a list of the zip codes in their area with, with coordinates, then yeah. I can make my own database of it, and then that's like my own creative right. Yes, then you create your own database. You did not copy their database. The only problem is cities do not have that list. Oh. Cities only... Uh, make new, uh, they, they make a, a, a new uh, suburb or a new street and they tell the postal company, hey guys, we made a new street. And then the postal company says, okay, we make a, a zip code for that or make a zip code extension for that. So nobody but the postal code, uh, 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 TNT Post, uh, uh, PostNL, is the only one who has a complete list of all the zip codes. Until the late 90s, the same situation applied with laws. Nobody except two commercial publishers had a copy of the Dutch laws in its entirely as it currently existed. Because the lawmaker would only say, okay guys, we have a new law. Or, okay guys, we're changing article 3.15 of the civil code to read as follows. So they only published a diff in, in computer terms for over 100 years. 
And if you only publish diffs over 100 years and you have a 100 year old original, that tends to be very difficult. And we only had two commercial companies that had the complete actual copy of the law as it existed. And that was a problem because then they could claim a database right on the law because they invested in building the high quality law and they would say, yeah, yeah but you can go to the Staatsblatt, uh, the official Dutch magazine where you can read all the, uh, uh, the diffs, you go back 100 years and then you know the law. And the state actually had to invest a lot of money in buying back the database rights on the laws and publishing it on, on wetten.nl, uh, laws.nl in Dutch, and now you can read the official laws over there. So that, that's a kind of silly thing that can happen uh, with this. But if you like OpenStreetMap or if you want to make an open database with, with zip codes, you will have to find it out yourself. So with OpenStreetMap, you will actually have to walk all the Dutch streets and determine the GPS coordinates, and there are lots of volunteers doing that. But uh, they were very fortunate that some, some uh, mapping company donated a lot of GPS data, uh, which made the work a lot easier. All right. um, then we also have the design rights. Design rights protect the, the outside appearance of a product. Could be protected by copyright if it's creative, but the mere fact that you make some design, you make something new, something that didn't exist before, allows you to get a database right. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a design right. A design right or model right uh, basically means nobody may copy your design. And uh, unlike the previous two rights, uh, they are registered. For example, here at the top, I, I put the TomTom Go uh, navigation computer and you can see the design right of that product at the top right. So nobody may, may, may copy the navigator design of TomTom. Um, if you make a shaver, it may not look too much like the Philly shave that you have over there on the left. And if you want to make a tablet, it should not look too much like the tablet on the right. Um, except when it's found out that in the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, there already was a tablet that kind of looked like that, because the design has to be new. And a fictional design, like uh, uh, the tablet from, from 2001, could invalidate your design right. Design rights are, are uh, very important when you look at hardware, uh, new products. Uh, for example, at the corner I saw here a 3D printer. They could infringe design rights when you print something, but they do not apply to software. More specifically, the user interface of a piece of software is by law excluded from a design right. So you cannot apply for a design right on the Windows look and feel or the GNOME look and feel. Uh, yes, please. I see some technical drawings and identifiers. Are design rights also automatic or do you have to register? You have to register a design right. You have to apply for it. You have to say, okay, this is my design. This is what it looks like. They will rubber stamp it. But it is, uh, uh, it is there, it's classified, so you can actually search for it. You, you can say, well, uh, it, should be, uh, it should have a computer screen or not, it should have a button, it should have a, a power plug and things like that. So a very advanced database you can look for. And, and then you still have to look, does my product look very similar to this one or not? And uh, if you think, well, this uh, design right is a problem, you will have to look for prior art, earlier designs that show that the design right was invalid. So you apply for it, but there is no test in advance. I thought there was another question. Nope, okay. Moving on. Patents, the, the meat of my presentation, patents protect technical features, technical solutions, technical inventions that solve a particular problem. Originally designed for things like light bulbs, for example, or robots, uh, but also seemingly they can be used for, for things like data communication, audio, video compression, and even one-click shopping. Apparently, or at least, well, I'm going to explain to you how, how, how that works these days, but that is the kind of subject matter people apply patents for. A patent has to be new, and a patent has to be inventive. So you apply for a patent, and then the patent office will say, oh, but this already existed, or what you have invented is something obvious over the prior art, the things that already existed when you applied for it, therefore you cannot have your patent. Take an example, uh, this is from 1964. Um, when there was a problem in the harbor of Kuwait, there was a, a ship full of sheep and it sank in the harbor. So all the sheep drowned, naturally, but that was not the real problem. The real problem was that they had the ship with rotting dead sheep in front of the uh, drinking water intake in the Kuwait harbor. So they needed to get that ship out of there fast. Normal way of doing that, you take two or three ropes, you pull it around uh, the ship's hull and you lift it. But there's like a 60% chance that the ship will break at some point. So then you have two half ships, or, or maybe three uh, one-third ships, but you also have 20,000 dead sheep floating around in the harbor in front of the, 
fresh water intake. So that was kind of not desirable. So they hired this guy, Mr. Kreuer from Denmark, to find a solution. And what he did is he took plastic balls filled with, with air. And as you can see over here, he would push them forcibly into the ship to create enough upward lift to, as you can see over here from Neil Scientist, you can actually the ship rise from the water and then you take a tugboat, you drag it out of there, you go into the ocean and you drop the ship again. Is that an invention? It certainly is clever. It certainly is something inventive. This was not very obvious at the time. Everybody was struggling with the problem and then this guy comes along and said, hey guys, this is how you do it. But an invention has to be something new. It, hasn't, it shouldn't be described anywhere in the world uh, at all before. It should have been used at all before. And as it turns out, this had been used in 1947 in the Donald Duck comic where they raised a boat by putting in uh, ping pong ball, table tennis balls, which are also filled with air, of course. Different kind of plastic, different kind of air, and of course fictional, but still sufficient to invalidate the patent. Yes, please. That is correct. Uh, a patent has to be something new, something that doesn't exist before, but you can have a complete uh, theoretical description without a practical implementation, which can invalidate a patent. Of course, a theoretical description only invalidates the things that are in that description. So if the guy had said, well, I'm not patenting putting balls through a tube to raise a ship, but I have invented a piece, of, a, a kind of plastic or a kind of styrofoam that contains a lot of air and can withstand a lot of pressure, and I'm using, I'm patenting those specific balls, then that would be new over the Donald Duck picture because the Donald Duck picture only shows ping pong balls. And ping pong balls cannot withstand a lot of pressure, so they will actually compress uh, and they will not work anymore. But your new plastic would still be patentable. So why do people have patents? Patents are, are, are a great way of decorating your home. You can get them in a frame and you can pat them on a wall. Um, and, well, if you are a, a startup company and you want to get venture capital, uh, the, the venture capitalist will say, do you have a patent on your system? And if you do not, they will not give you money. But if you say, yes, I have a patent application in the works, uh, then they suddenly will give you lots of money, even when nobody has yet judged whether the patent is valid or not. It's a very strange reason, but I get a lot of companies that say, can you get me a patent? I don't care on what, uh, but I need a patent, otherwise I will not get money. It's a very strange way of working it. <coughs> Original idea of patents was to give exclusivity. So if you are a company and you invented something, you would get a patent and you would be the only one that could sell that particular product or technology. Uh, Gillette is a, still a very famous user of this particular system. They will patent their shaving mechanisms, their shaving heads, uh, to make sure that nobody else can copy them. And all the competitors will have to use a very different system. You can actually look in the Gillette patents, how they do it, uh, what's the mechanism like, how are the blades positioned, and things like that. Because that is the rule under the patents. You have to describe how, what your patent looks like, what your invention uh, looks like, how it works, so that other people can copy it which is strange, you have to tell people how to imitate your invention, but at the same time you get a legal right to stop people from doing that. And that legal right exists for 20 years after you apply it. So Gillette, in this case in 1904, got a patent on their, on their uh, razor, and in 1924 the patent expired, so then competitors could use that system. But in the meantime, of course, Gillette had a new system, which they also patented, so you could only copy the old razors. But this is the idea behind patents, telling people this is how I made my invention, this is how I get the blades that will shave you so nicely, and uh, in return for telling you that, uh, telling the world that you get an exclusive right for 20 years, so nobody may copy what you have invented. So the idea was, instead of keeping invention secrets, you now reveal your inventions to the public and we reward you with a 20-year uh, system of protection. Um, but that original idea has uh, evaporated, lots of different models have come along, especially in the semiconductor industry, they already found for a very long time uh, that you couldn't be exclusive. You couldn't be the only one that made a semiconductor for a particular purpose because everybody had patents, so you had to figure out some way uh, to protect uh, yourself and work together with competition. So this is what, where the term cross-licensing comes in. The idea here is everybody in the industry basically says to everybody else, okay, I will leave you alone. I will not attack your, you with, your, with my patents if you promise not to attack me with your patents. And with that kind of uh, cold war, basically, you could 
essentially operate in your market. You could hold off the new guys that wanted to come in that did not have patents. If you had a lot of patents, you could say, okay, uh, I will leave you alone, but you have to pay me a little extra money. So that was yeah, kind of a cold war, people leaving each other alone in return for paying a little money. And everybody had to build up a big patent portfolio, protecting yourself uh, against people that would come along. But basically being able to say, I have lots of patents, leave me alone. That, that was the system that evolved in that particular market. And the same thing, uh, uh, same situation is now uh, starting to exist in the software world. Um, in the early 80s, Philips and Sony invented compact disc and that not only revolutionized music, but also the patent world. Because what Philips did was basically saying, we will allow anybody to copy our technology. Everybody may make compact discs and players for compact discs. The only thing is you have to pay us. And the amounts uh, as reported in public were uh, $2.50 for a player and 25 cents for a disc, $25 cents for a disc. So uh, if you wanted to, to make that device, you had to adhere to the specification and you had to pay money to Philips and Sony. And that of course was a great cash cow because this was very great technology. Everybody wanted to use it, but you didn't have to invent it yourself. You could just look at the patents and the specifications, see how it worked and then copy it uh, yourself. So that was a very successful technology and that brought a lot of money uh, uh, in the order of billions to, uh, to Philips and Sony over those 20, 30 years. And that was for a lot of people a wake up call. Hey, hang on a second, I can make shit loads of money with patents. If I have a technology that is successful as compact disc, I can make billions. So lots of people started looking for that, which is why now all kinds of standards that you see out there, they all will have patents, they all will have licensing schemes, and they all will say you will have to pay this amount of money and you have to include by logo and you have to do this and you have to do that. So they all want to make money the same way that Philips did. It's not gonna work, of course. Philips and Sony managed to do it because they were the first. Uh, because it was such a good technology and there was such a great demand in the market. But for any particular plug technology these days, I would say, well, there's 10 alternatives available, so you are not going to be as rich uh, as they were. But still, you could have a product and you could put it out, you could be exclusive, you could negotiate with other people, you could license it, make a decent sum of money. Um, but what we saw uh, in, in the last few years, five to ten years, is something else appearing, which is called the Patent Troll. Patent Troll is a company that only has patents and lawyers, and they will try to sue everybody for patent infringement and then to make a settlement. So they don't want to keep their technology exclusive, they don't want to create a cold war where they can operate, and they don't even want to license their technology to make it a world standard, they just want money. And this has been uh, particularly popular in the United States, because in the United States a lawsuit is very expensive and a patent lawsuit is even more expensive. To give you an example, if you want to fight a successful lawsuit, you will spend five million dollars on lawyers. And that's only the first instance, because then you can have an appeal and it will cost you another five to ten million dollars. So if somebody comes along and says, you infringe my patent and I want a hundred thousand dollars, then every US lawyer will tell you, okay, pay the guy. Because if we have to fight the guy, it will be 10 times, 50 times that amount, and that makes no business sense. And also, in the meantime, he can get an injunction, he can block the product, and we will get into big trouble, we cannot launch the product. And this is what the trolls know. You ask for a little money, little extortion money, and they will pay you, and uh, if they want to fight this, well, it will cost them a lot more, it will take years, they will be tied up in court, uh, they will have to drag out all their engineers to prove as experts that they didn't infringe the patent, they made something, uh, something completely different, so uh, that will cost them so much money and time that it simply will kill your company if you do that. And that is actually one of the biggest problems with patents, in particular with software patents, but the same thing also applies in other industries. Um, yes, please? Could you speak up a little? So, if, if you, you attack a patent, um, that patent could be declared invalid. Uh, okay, can you sue the patent troll for, for anything? Uh, you mean if, if they lose, if the patent is declared invalid, for example? Um, 
Yeah. Well, what you can do if somebody comes with, uh, with a patent, you, you basically have three options. One is to settle, to pay the money to go away. The other one is to attack the patent and to prove that the patent was invalid or uh, that you do not infringe the patent at all, which is the expensive thing. And uh, the third thing you could do is take the product off the market. And yeah, neither option is very attractive. They will all cost you a lot of money, but the first option is the cheapest one. Um, what you could do with a normal company is counter sue, which is what the semiconductors people would do. They would say, oh, you sue me for that patent. Oh, but hang on, I have this patent and I have this patent. So now you have to give me money. And this guy would say, oh, but I have also this patent and that patent. And then, well, you can see the stacks rising. And that was the way to, uh, to address it at that point. But for a patent troll, that doesn't work because they don't do anything except suing. And there's no patent on, on suing. Yeah. So you, if you pay the 5 million for a lawsuit, you might not get it back if you win. Yeah. True. You, you will not get, get your money back if you win a patent lawsuit. That, that is a problem, especially if it's an empty shell company. So it only has one patent, it hires lots of lawyers, and uh, it, it has nothing else. So yeah, that's a problem. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to move on because I wanted to focus on pa software patents specifically. Um, you may have heard this quote before. It's a quote from Bill Gates in 1991. If people had understood how patents would be granted in this industry, in the, in the software industry, and they had taken out patents at that time, our industry would be at a complete standstill today. Um, Bill Gates, yeah, I know lots of people hate him, but he was a very visionary businessman. And he had a very great vision about software patents and how it would block the industry. He was completely right. And it did block the industry, or at least is blocking the industry right now. The problem is, at the very beginning of the software industry, um, nobody thought you could patent software. So everybody could just copy everybody else's ideas, implementations, inventions, etc., algorithms, and you could just use them. You shouldn't, use, uh, you shouldn't copy other people's source code. There was copyright on that. Uh, if you had gotten something under an NDA in confidence, you couldn't use that. But if you just put some engineers in a room and you said, okay, guys, make me software that does this, then you would be in the clear. So everybody could steal everybody else's ideas, to put it in negative terms, and everybody could make their own implementation, could make their own alternative. We had hundreds of, of spreadsheet programs, um, word processing software, games, etc., etc., And they all had a chance to prove themselves in the market. We had some failures, we had some good guys. Everybody could just do whatever they wanted, as long as it didn't violate copyright. But at some point, people started taking out patents on software and uh, started to, to uh, assert those patents against other companies that use the same ideas. And for Microsoft in particular, uh, uh, this is very interesting, because uh, Microsoft was one of the first guys to be uh, the victim of a software patent lawsuit. Did anybody use Stacker back in the days? Nobody? Okay. Maybe... Uh, Microsoft Double Space. Okay, so this was very interesting because I, I still remember when you had, I think, MS DOS 3.3 or 4.0, something like that, you had Stacker. And Stacker would compress your hard disk so you would have 40 megabytes instead of 20 in, in my particular case. And it would be a resident software running in the background on DOS and double your, your hard disk capacity. Um, as it turns out, Stacker was discussing with Microsoft licensing their technology, their software, to put it into MS-DOS at that time. And there was some discussion and they shared some source code, they shared most particularly their algorithms and the way it worked. And then Microsoft looked at it and said, yeah, this is very nice, but we don't think this is going to fly. Thank you and goodbye. And then in the next version of uh, MS-DOS, there was something called Double Space, and which did not use any of the source code that Stacker provided them, but it did use the same ideas, it did use the same algorithms. Uh, so Stack said, well, you violated our copyright, but Microsoft said, yeah, we didn't copy anything. And then Stack said, oh, but we have a patent. And Microsoft, you are infringing our patent because you are implementing our algorithms. Uh, you have, have copied our idea, you have copied our, our compression algorithm, compression scheme. And they went to court and they actually won. They got like $50 million uh, from Microsoft for stealing the inventions. They were one of the very few companies that successfully won against Microsoft by saying, you stole our idea. And this was because they had patents. Microsoft was famous in those days for copying other people's ideas. They would say, oh, come to us. We have a little discussion about what you have, and maybe we can license your technology. And then they would tell you, oh, we are not interested. And then they would implement it themselves. They were very infamous for doing that. And Stack was the only one, well, very few ones, that said, oh, but we have a patent. We can win from that. And so they won. 
And then Microsoft said, well, this is a problem, and uh, we should not have this again. Uh, how do we defend against it? Well, let's file patents of our own. And actually, if you look at the, the, the Microsoft patents by year, you will see here they lost a lawsuit, and then they said, okay, let's have patents on our own, and you will see an enormous increase in the patents that they have. But there's a distinct jump here, three years, four years later, which is about the average time that you need to get a patent, three to four years. So, uh, yeah, my theory is when, when uh, the stack patent lawsuit came along and they lost the patent lawsuit, uh, they said, let's have patents of our own, and they started building their portfolio. Um, of course, they weren't the only ones doing this. Lots of people were applying for patents, and more and more patents were being applied for in those days, uh, which you can see at the number of software patents, in particular uh, in the US, which is the red bars, and in Europe, which is the blue bars. And you see, uh, I'm, I'm missing a picture over here, but uh, never mind. You see, in particular, a big rise somewhere here in the early 90s, and then in particular in the 2000s, and again in 2006. They are three very distinct events that happened. The first, oh, there we are with the picture. Um, there were several important court cases that determined the scope of patent law. The, the first one is the Allopat case, uh, the second one in Europe is the IBM case, and the third one in the United States is the State Street or the State Street Bank case. And they, to a very important extent, determined patent law and in particular software patent law. The Allopat case was a very important breakthrough case because in the US patent law it says you can patent a new machine or a method of manufacture. And then the question, question was if I have an oscilloscope, an existing machine, and I put in an algorithm to make a smoother picture on the screen, so an, an image smoothing algorithm, can I get a patent on that? And at first the patent would say no, you cannot because the machine already exists, so you have not invented a new machine. But in appeals, uh, the court said Programming a general purpose computer creates a new machine. And then you can patent the new machine. So you can patent an existing oscilloscope with an algorithm that would make a smoother waveform, a smoother picture, and you can get a patent on that. And that is a new machine, and therefore you have a patent on your new machine. So lots of people then realized you can get a patent on anything as long as you present it as a new machine or an existing machine programmed with the new software and they would start getting uh, patents on all kinds of things. The other breakthrough in the US was a State Street Bank company that had invented a new method of met managing its stock portfolios for its customers. And they had invented algorithms to determine when do, should we buy, when should we sell these stocks to create the optimum value of that. That has of course nothing to do with technology, it's pure bookkeeping, it's, it's, it's financial management, but they put it in software. And then they patented that software. And in appeals, the court said, the US Court of Appeals, you can patent that kind of software because it produces a useful, concrete, and tangible result. And that kind of result is the kind of thing that patent law wants to reward. So you have a new machine, you have a device that produces a useful, concrete, and tangible result. It gives you a better return on your investment, which is tangible because money is tangible and ultimately all business, all technology is about making money. So you should get a patent on this. And that, uh, was the, the great stimulus for the e-commerce patents that we have seen. This was a decision in 1999. And with that decision, the court basically said, hey, you have something e-commerce, you can patent it. And in 99, everybody was doing e-commerce, so everybody started to patent everything. Then it also turns out they didn't have the right prior art databases in the US, so they couldn't determine if ideas were new. So you could just say, oh, I have an idea. It has a tangible result, so I should be able to patent it. Then there was no literature to check if the idea already existed. And there were 10 times as many patent applications as before. So the US Patent Office basically rubber stamped everything that came along if you dress it up the right way. And now the US is full of crappy patents that are blocking just about everything. Because it takes $5 million to shoot down such a patent. So that is a very, very big problem. Let me just jump ahead a little. Now, in Europe, the situation was a little different because in Europe we had a, a European patent convention, European patent law that very specifically said you cannot get a patent on programs for computers, not regarded as inventions, blah, 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 programs for computers. So no matter what you do, you cannot invent 
uh, a program for a computer. But then they added this little sentence that has given me headaches every time uh, I read it since, since about 1999. It's not an invention to have a program for a computer, but only if the patent application relates to such subject matter as such. So what the hell is a computer program as such? I have no idea. Um, if you look at what a computer program is, you can present it in lots of ways. You can say, well, it's pure mathematics. Right? It's an algorithm. You can say, well, it's source code, it's words, it's instructions put together. Um, you could say, well, it's, it's an ASIC, it's something programmed, a uh, general purpose chip, it's a special purpose chip, or it's, it's a simple carrier that contains binary instructions or source code instructions. They are all software. All of these we would call software, but yeah, to the eye, to our intuition, they are somehow different. Is there anybody that can give a definition of software? Who dares? I remember a very long time ago when, when I studied informatics here, and uh, we had one of our professors um, uh, that, that gave a very intriguing definition. Software is the piece of a computer that does not hurt you when it falls on your foot. <laughs> But, yeah. Which is very nice, it's a very good definition, but completely unworkable in practice, of course. But yeah, which one of these is the software as such? Let, let, let's put the question to that. And conversely, on which one do I deserve to get a patent? If I invent this algorithm here, should I get a patent on the algorithm? Well, probably not, because then nobody can use an algorithm, but I could turn it into source code, I could implement it, and then nobody could use that source code, but hang on, did we have copyright for that? So what if I put it into a little ROM and I put that into an FPGA and I put that out there? Is it then maybe hardware because I put it in a, in a concrete device and that will hurt your foot if you, if you step on it? Or maybe if I fix it in a ROM, so not an FPGA but, but an ASIC, specially designed to do one thing, which is that algorithm, should I get a patent on that? Or just if I have a binary code and I put it on a, on a memory chip? Do that, does that make a difference? I mean, in practice, that disk is going to make the difference. If you don't have the disk, the device is not going to be very useful. So, somehow that device is the invention, that little chip is the invention, but yeah, should I get a patent on that? Because if I have a patent on that SD card with, with the code, then I also have a patent on the algorithm. Effectively, I mean, yeah, people can use the algorithm if they want, but if they want to use it in practice, they will have to make a little disk like that. So, I should be able to use Uh, that patent. Uh, uh, I should, they should not be able to, to do that because I have a patent. So that was a very big problem for the, for the European Patent Office. Um, in the early days, 1978, they basically said, well, what you do is you compare the invention to what is already known. And then if you see the hardware is the same, it's just instructions added to the system, the contribution, uh, as they would call it, then there is no patentable subject matter. So if you had like a pianola and you would basically add uh, a new song to it, that was not patentable because that device is the same thing. You just add different instructions, we'll play different music. You cannot patent that. Same thing, if you have a general purpose computer, well, by, uh, by itself, that's an invention. The IBM PC was an invention, but the mere fact that you add new software it, to it does not allow you to get a patent on that. You cannot patent a general purpose computer, not even if it doubles your disk capacity without having to add a new drive or a new drive platter. So, not patentable at all. But in the 1980s, uh, there was a lot of push from people that said, but we are making more and more devices that comprise software, that have software internally, and the new stuff comes for the software. It's not just the fact that we have a general purpose computer, but it's actually the software that realizes the invention. And then the patent office reversed itself and said, well, actually, what you have to do is look at what the software does. If what the software does is something new and inventive, so it, it's something technical, it's something not obvious, then you should get a patent. We should not deny you a patent merely because it's possible to implement that invention in software. So you can patent a computer loaded with stacker. You cannot patent the software because that's software as such, but you can patent a computer that is preloaded with that particular software. And then in uh, 2010, They basically, uh, in 2000, but later also in 2010, they said, well, you know, if you can patent a computer with software, 
and the invention is in the software, you should also be allowed to patent the software. Because it makes little sense to allow you a patent if it's loaded on a computer and not if it's loaded on an external disk. Uh, so you can patent this, but you can also patent the software itself. And this is not software as such, because it's technical software. I do not understand that either, but that is what they say officially. Um, I'm going to skip this one. So this is what the EPO president said in 2006. We do not grant patents for computer programs as such, but we grant patents for computer implemented inventions that are novel, inventive and technical. So if it's an invention that is realized in software, you can patent it. But if it's software, you cannot patent it. If you can tell me a distinction between those two sentences, uh, uh, you can become a very rich guy, a very rich patent attorney. But this is the official rule. Um, so with that rule, it was allowed to patent just about anything as long as you could somehow present it as being a technical invention. Like it was a robot uh, that is more accurate. Uh, you can double your disk capacity. You can have a bigger picture, a better picture on the screen. Uh, you can push more audio and video uh, through a transmission channel or something like that. Or you can detect copying and then prevent it. You can store more data uh, on a video disk and so on. Um, but that was the opinion, basically, of the European Patent Office. The European Patent Office is the institute that grants patents that are valid for Europe, and they operate under what's called the European Patent Convention, the European Patent Law. But there's a very peculiar part in this law, which is that once the patent has been granted, it is converted into patents into all the individual countries of Europe. So you get a European patent application, you get a European patent, and then you g it, it gets transformed into a Dutch patent, a German patent, a French patent, the Italian patent, a Greek patent, and so on and so forth. But the only requirement that you have to translate it in that particular language. And this is because the European countries could not agree on the language uh, issue for a European patent. Because at first they would say, well, let's do it in German. Because German is, is the language of technology. And then the, the English people said, no, you cannot do that. It should also be in English because English is the world language these days and uh, all patents should be published in German and in English. And then the French came along and said, hang on, but we are still a big country too. All the patents should be published in French as well. Otherwise, they should not be valid in France. And then the Italians said the same thing and the Greeks said the same thing. So in the end, they could not agree on what language the European patent should be in. Yes, please. Yes, yes. If you want to translate a patent in a particular language, you have to hire a very specialized guy, usually a patent attorney in those countries that will make the translation. Um, they tend to be very expensive. Uh, a normal translation service is like 18 cents per word, something like that, 18, 19 cents. Uh, for a patent, it could be 25 to 30 cents per word. And if you go to like, like Poland or Bulgaria, finding somebody who can translate patents and is good enough to actually do it, well, it will be a lot of money. But you have the option of saying, uh, I will not translate it into Bulgarian or Greek, but then your patent will not be valid in Greece or in, in Bulgaria. So that is the compromise that we have. Ever since they had this system, every patent holder has been complaining about the cost of the patent system, because it's like 20,000 euros to get a European patent. Conversely, if you want to get a US patent, it's like $6,000. Uh, $6, if you want to do it expensive, it could be $8,000, uh, something like that. But if you're a small entity, you get a 50% discount from the government. So for the entire US, which is about the same uh, uh, piece of land geographically, it's $4,000, maybe $8,000. If you go to Europe, it will be 20,000 euros. So guess who has the most patents? Uh, and that's a big, big problem for just about everybody, except the bureaucrats in Europe that say, well, you know, uh, Greece is, is still an important language and every, everything should be translated into Greek. Anyway, so that was the European Patent Office. But then the European Commission said, well, we cannot agree on what language patents should be in. We cannot agree when a patent should be valid. But you know what we are going to do? We are going to make a law when software is patentable. Nobody understand why they wanted to do that. Nobody really had asked them to do that, not even patent holders, but they said, well, let's do it anyway. And then they made what's known as a directive on comp computer implemented inventions, or the software patent directive, depending on who you ask. So the European Commission basically said, 
Well, what the European Patent Office has, has been doing for the past years is actually a great idea. Let's make a directive that allows you to patent software as long as it is somehow on a carrier and it is somehow technical in one particular way. And this created a big back, uh, backlash from uh, lots of people, in particular in the open source industry, that pointed out the current uh, uh, European patents that, uh, that existed that you would get and how silly things would be. So they found patents, for example, paying by credit card, because paying by credit card, that is a way of transmitting sensitive data in a secure manner uh, to a particular channel. Uh, you could use rebate codes, so you have a transaction and then you see a particular code and you with, uh, uh, subtract something from the total amount. Well, that's technical calculation and uh, you can patent that kind of thing. So there was lots of, of protest even from there. I don't know if anybody here was in one of those protests in Brussels or Germany. Great. Do you see yourself on the picture? So there was lo lots, of, uh, uh, lots of protest about that uh, uh, because it was felt that if you could get a patent on these kind of things, the European software industry would come at a complete standstill. So something should be done to block that kind of patents. And the European Parliament, which is uh, needed to in, in that kind of procedure, basically said, well, we cannot have that. We cannot allow the European industry to be blocked by that kind of patents, in particular when you have all these uh, uh, American companies applying for these patents and, and Dutch uh, uh, European companies do not have that kind of patent so we should block them. And what they did is they, they rewrote the directive and said well we will only allow a directive if it includes the statement that innovations in the field of data processing are not considered to be inventions within the meaning of patent law. So not computer programs as such but data processing. You cannot patent data processing at all. And that's Sounds like a great solution because then you cannot patent rebate codes and then you cannot patent uh, credit card payments or one-click shopping and things like that. But you also eliminate other things. For example, is Morse transmission, wireless transmission, isn't that data processing? There was a patent on it in, in, in actually patent 1647 to Samuel Morse is a patent on the Morse code. Uh, to me, the Morse system and, and the method of communication is an invention. Yes, please. Are you of the opinion that some stuff should be patentable or do you just want no patents at all? Do I want no patents at all? I think it's a, a patent system is in theory a good idea. And uh, if you have a system where people tend to keep things a secret, giving them a patent to lure them into revealing that system is a very uh, good system. The problem with patents basically is you give everybody exclusive rights. So you have a big piece of land you divide it in 10,000 small areas and then you say to all those 10,000 people, okay guys, now play nice and make a big shopping mall or whatever. That is not going to work. But if you have like the US World West where you say, okay guys, we have this, this vast area, go claim it, shoot all the Indians that you see, uh, we don't care about that, go claim the country and make something beautiful, then it works. But who here thinks the Moore system is an invention worthy of a patent. Should at the time, eh, of course. All right. And who should? No, no, even at that time, they should not have granted a patent on it. Okay, why not? Uh, I read this book about why not patent stuff, but basically it's a monopoly. It is. And most monopolies are bad. And uh, when there are technical inventions, you see a lot of communities propping up, uh, sharing their technology. The same happened with the invention of the steam engine, which is a big case for This is always the debate when you grant a patent. If you grant a patent, you give somebody a monopoly. For 20 years, you, sir, are the only one that may make this kind of devices. It's a good thing because it gives him a big carrot to make that kind of invention. And then he knows, okay, for 20 years, I'm the only one that can exploit it. So let me invest into rolling out the technology, rolling out the infrastructure, uh, uh, setting it up, and I can recover my investment over 20 years. But at the same time, you block people from making slightly different things if you can still cover them by the patent. In the steam engine, for example, you're very right. There was a very broad patent to James Watt on the steam engine and nobody else was able to make steam engines uh, that work in practice. But a later example, when you look at uh, uh, the petrol engine, there was a patent on that and then Mr. Otto Diesel sat down and said, okay, how can I work around this patent? 
and he invented the diesel engine, which works on a different principle. So now we have, thanks to patents, the petrol engine and the diesel engine, which work in a different way. And if we had had no patents, then Mr. Diesel would maybe not have invented his system. So that is always the debate. In Europe, the shining example of why we should have patent law is GSM. The GSM mobile communication system was a collaboration from, from European companies and governments to work out a common standard for data communication. And they all had patents on their particular aspect of the technology and they sat together and they made uh, the GSM standard together and then licensed the patents to everybody that wanted to use the GSM standard, which is why in Europe it's so successful. In the US, everybody implemented their own system, which is why you still have no universal mobile coverage in the US. Everybody keep, kept their own system and it didn't work together. And that worked in the light, uh, 80s and 90s when GSM was invented. But these days you can get a pure software implementation. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but this is a, a, a GSM stack that just works on Linux. So if you have a computer and uh, you can connect it to a SIM card somehow, you can call. So you have a pure software implementation on a laptop that allows you to do GSM. And if you say that this is good, patent on this system, then you say that this is bad. People should not make that kind of software without paying licensing fees and they should listen to the patent holders. But conversely, if you say this is good, then you basically say, well, this should not have happened this way. People should not have worked together on a standard on the basis of patents, expecting them to make, uh, to make money with their patents. They should just have shared it. And then the question is whether they would have. And that has, has been the key debate. Now, in the software uh, patent directive, this has always been the central debate. How, would we get, how do we get the most innovation out of patents, do we, uh, uh, out of technology? Do we do it by granting patents and then allowing people to make money by exclusivity or licensing? Or do we say people should innovate and share and they should be able to take each other's ideas and build on that? And that has, has been raging for some time. Uh, the procedure for getting a European law, European directive is very complex. I'm not going to explain it, but you can already see from here, it's very expensive. But at some point there was a final vote in the European Parliament uh, where everybody was lobbying very hard. I was slightly involved in that as well. I, I worked at Philips at the time, and of course Philips was pro-patent. Um, and then uh, I, I still love this picture because this was right behind the parliament where uh, our lobbying guys, they had hired a big boat to, to put this poster up for all the people in parliament so they would be working in their little office and they would see vote for the CII directive with, with the big boat. And then some people from the... Uh, the FFII, the, the Foundation for a Free Information Infrastructure, they found that, they quickly organized the canoe somehow and they went with a little boat out there. And I still love the symbolism that this picture expresses because this big boat represents everything about the, the patent owning industry. You're big, you're kind of invisible, you have a nice clean message out there. And these are the SMEs, they just put something together, you work with some people, you have a t-shirt, you have a little sign, it's not as clean as neat, but it's personal, it's creative, it's inventive. So which is better for Europe? You have the big companies that are able to hire a boat and print up a nice banner and put it out there, but are not very personal and uh, approachable. Or do you want lots of little canoes of people that work together, simply say, okay, let's hire one, put out a flag, and somebody else puts out a banner. And that has always been the big debate. In the end, uh, they rejected the proposal. With, with 648 to 14 people, so only 14 people were not paying attention, everybody else killed the software patent directive, and we are still uh, and in the same position as before. We have no official law that says software is patentable or software is unpatentable. The only thing we have is the European Patent Office that says, well, if it's a technical invention, it is patentable even when you do it in software. In the US, they already had that old law about uh, useful, concrete and tangible, but these days, in the, in the Bilski case and the Mayo case, which are two important Supreme Court cases, they said, you can only patent useful concrete machines. And this was not in the context of software, so we don't really know what it means for software, but it already says you cannot patent medical algorithms and medical treatment procedures, DNA and life. It has to be a concrete machine, a concrete implementation of what you learned from those systems, and those cases may prove to be limitations on software law. We don't know yet, but that is what could happen. In Europe, we still have the same rules. Um, and we even have the Board of Appeals of, of the European Patent Office itself saying, well, you know, if you really look at the word technology carefully, a pen and pencil is technology. 
it's very old technology, of course, but it still is technology. So you should, in theory, be able to get a patent on writing using pen and paper. Of course, it's not new, it's not inventive, so we should kill the patent based on that. But the argument, it's very old technology, it's a steam engine, it's a general purpose computer, is not valid because yeah, a pen and paper is something you can patent, therefore this is something you can patent. Um, I'm going to skip these ones. Um, and uh, just a final remark, there have been some recent uh, uh, publications and decisions about the European Patent Court. You may have heard about that. But the idea is that we should finally solve that language issue. We should get one European patent and we should get one European law and one European court where you can go for your patent infringement. This is, of course, a lot cheaper and this is, of course, more effective than having all kinds of separate courts, like what we see with the Apple Samsung case, where the English court would say there is no infringement, the Dutch court would say, well, there is a little infringement, and the German court would say, well, but the design right is invalid, or, or something like that. So you want one patent court. And in the context of this patent court, there have been some discussions whether we should also include rules about what is patentable or not. So then you get the discussion again, hey, are they trying to patent software again or not? And what should we do about that? And in the meantime, free software, open source, uh, and free beer to a certain extent has become more and more popular despite patents and, and avoiding patents these days. And I think that's a great thing because open source has been showing how companies can collaborate, how companies can share innovation, and you see more and more companies, including companies with patents, working with open source and making money out of that. And somehow, sometimes I speculate that the GPL in particular is basically what the patent system should have been. You are forced to disclose your source code, but you get some kind of legal right out of it. You can demand that you get access to other people's source code, which is kind of analogy to the old patent system. If you tell us how your software works, how your invention works, you will get a legal right to it. But yeah, of course, a patent right, as originally designed, was created for one company to control one piece of innovation, but in, in software system you do not have one person that creates one piece of software everybody has to work together software is not one thing software is a big stack software is a big collection that you have to put together and the patent system is not really designed for that ladies and gentlemen in the interest of time uh, that was my presentation i hope i still have time for one or two questions or proponents just one or two just one or two okay who dares yes please So how can you protect your, your open source project, your, your emerging project from, from third parties that suddenly patent it? Well, um, the easiest thing is publish as much as you can. Because a patent can only be acquired on something that is new, remember the Donald Duck picture. So if you publish what you do, whether it's source code or just a white paper or even just a web page, you reveal to the public how things work. So what you publish there is not new anymore. So a company that later says, let's patent the same thing, their patent will be invalid because you already put your publications out there. Make sure that there is a date on whatever you publish and try to make it so that the date is independent. So not just you putting the date, but host it somewhere else. If you host it on GitHub or SourceForge, they will add a date and that is proof that it existed in 2012. And therefore the 2014 patent application is invalid, etc. Of course, somebody could have a patent which they applied before you started to work. So then you have a problem because that patent, well, you cannot invalidate it with your own publications. You were too late. You were doing something they invented before. And then you basically have two options. The first one is to try and find prior art, which is even older than the patent. So you can kill the patent. And the other one is to try and work around the patent. So you study the patent, you see what they claim, and you find some alternative. But both of them are, are very expensive and very difficult to do. Um, we have one maybe saving grace in Europe, which is that you can only infringe a patent if you are commercially practicing the invention. So if you are a non-profit and you are not making any money, by definition, you cannot infringe a patent. 
but that means no t-shirts, no advertisements, uh, no selling of services to the same uh, institute. You are just publishing source code as a complete non-profit just for the good of society. And then in Europe you can avoid patents. In the US you cannot avoid a patent that way, so if you host it on GitHub then uh, you can be hit by the US patent lawsuit. But then my cynical question would be, why would anybody want to sue a little Dutch foundation that has no money? Because if it has no money, what good is suing them? So maybe you can work around it that way. Right, one final question. So I'm a, I'm a Dutch programmer, when do I violate a Dutch patent, a, a, a US patent? Well, to, in, to infringe a US patent you have to practice the invention, you have to use the invention or distribute the invention in the United States. If you are only operating in the Netherlands there should be no issue. The mere fact that an American can download it from your Dutch web page is not an issue. If you host it on a server in the US you are infringing because then the distribution occurs entirely in the United States. If you make a Dutch language website and you put it up you do not infringe. If you make a English language website .com and you advertise it in the US then you infringe even when you are not physically in the US even when your server is not physically in the US. So what they're looking for is, is ties, connections to prove that you actively target the US market, that you actively market, promote, sell, distribute the invention in the US. So if you have a 1-800 number for example that proves you have connections in the US. 1-800 is a US phone number. If you have a Dutch number and you just say plus 31 something, I would say no, you are not advertising in the US. If you put a dollar amount for the software, this is a license for 99 cents each, you would infringe. If you put it in an app store that is hosted in the US, then you infringe, which is one of the reasons why Apple and Android have these different uh, app stores for different products, so particular apps are not sold to the US to avoid patent lawsuits. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I'll be here for a while and uh, enjoy the next presentation.